Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Newman. I'm with Thompson Coburn, and welcome uh, to the Government Contracts Know Your Rights and Responsibilities as a Federal Contractor series. Um, this is yet another uh, webinar in our series on government contracting issues, and today we will be talking about licensing intellectual property in the government contracting context. As I said, my name is Jeff Newman, and I'm here with my partner in St. Louis. Hey, my name is Kevin Kircher. I'm a, a patent attorney um, in the intellectual property group. And, and Kevin and I work very closely together when we, we mix intellectual property issues and government contracting issues on a regular basis for both our commercial clients and our government contracting clients. Well, with that, let us begin with what we're here to talk about today, and that is licensing intellectual property in both the government and commercial context. Uh, let's lay the foundation of what we're going to talk about today, and that is we're going to focus, due to the short nature of this course, on three types of IP. Uh, those three types are technical data, computer software, and patents or inventions. Uh, there are other types of IP, as you know, trademarks, copyrights, mask works, uh, uh, other forms of trade secrets and proprietary information. But the three main types of intellectual property we see in the government contract context, tech data, computer software, and inventions or patents uh, will be discussed today. We're also going to spend a good bit of time on understanding the differences between uh, protecting your intellectual property in both the military context, a DOD procurement, uh, as well as under a civilian agency procurement. Military procurements, as many of you may know, are done under the DFARS, uh, and the civilian agency procurements are handled under the FAR. Uh, as, as many of you know, those rules and regulations set forth in the FAR or the DFARS have standard rights uh, for non-commercial items. Uh, those rights uh, set forth the licensing obligations that contractors have to the government and what rights the government can uh, obtain in a contractor's intellectual property. One of the advantages of using commercial item agreements, it does provide a way forward in allowing contractors often to use their customary commercial license arrangements when working with the government, and we'll talk about that uh, fairly extensively today as well. And finally, we will sort of focus on some key licensing issues uh, in the uh, agreements that you negotiate with the government. Uh, mainly those are in commercial item agreements because, as I said, uh, if you are using the standard terms and conditions under the FAR or DFARS, you're most likely going to be required to use the standard license rights assigned under those regulations. But in the commercial item context, where you can use your commercial item terms and conditions, there are a few pointers we'd like to sort of end the program with uh, so that, you know, expectations are able to be managed uh, successfully when working with the government. Well, let us begin. I think the first half of the program today will talk about patents and inventions, and then the second half will switch to computer software and tech data. But if we start with the uh, discussion about patents, let me just say since 1980, uh, patent provisions under the federal government contracting regulations are, have been standardized, and those regulations have been based on a statute known as the Bayh-Dole Act. And the Bayh-Dole Act is implemented under the FAR at FAR Part uh, uh, FAR Part 27, but in particular the contract clause at 52.227-11. And the patent rights under federal government contracts are designed to promote, as it says on the slide, commercialization. And what does that mean? It's designed to protect new and obvious developments, and it serves as a powerful tool, as many of you know for, as contractors, for attracting investment and driving revenues on the bottom line. Uh, rights and patents involves title to the inventions, so you disclose your invention, you're able to obtain title to that invention. Uh, we're not talking about licensing per se, we're talking about title. Uh, licensing is we'll talk about in the second half of the program when we talk about data and software, such so as engineering drawings and source code and the like. Uh, that's where we deal with licensing. Here we are a focus on what is called, and this is a, an important definition, a subject invention. Uh, a subject invention is an invention that is conceived or first actually reduced to practice during the performance of work under a government uh, agreement. Once again, an invention of the contractor that is conceived or first actually reduced to practice in the performance of a work, in the performance of work under a government agreement. If you have a subject invention, 
Contractors can elect title to that subject invention. And in, in turn, the government gets a paid up royalty free license to have that invention practiced by or on behalf of the government. So the government does not obtain title necessarily to that invention. It can, and we'll talk about a situation in a moment where it may. But, but by and large, contractors, if they develop an invention under the government contract, they will elect title to that invention, and the government, for a licensing perspective, gets its paid-up royalty-free, non-exclusive, non-transferable license to have that invention practiced on behalf of the government. I should mention that contractors can lose title if it doesn't elect title in a timely manner or fails to disclose the invention in accordance with the procedures and policies of the U.S. government. Two events we should focus on here, and that is in the definition of a subject invention. The first conceived. What does first conceived mean? First conceived simply means the, the contractor has created the solution. They've thought up the solution that serves as the underlying basis of the invention. The more interesting, I think, component of that definition is what is an actual first actual reduction of pra to practice. Um, in the government contracts context, that's a you, where we see a, a building of a prototype, and usually that's the most expensive and riskiest way to demonstrate that there's a first actual reduction of practice. Uh, you don't have to have a tangible item in your hands to sort of satisfy that requirement. It can be done on a computer, on CAD drawings, and it's really done on a case-by-case -case basis. But if you have a prototype of the invention, that's generally considered in the government contracting world a first actual reduction of practice. Contrast that in the commercial sector where you're not merely filing a patent application because in that situation, in the commercial world, that's okay for uh, uh, the, the, uh, the granting of a patent because you have a constructive reduction of practice. Constructive reduction of practice does not work in the commercial sector, in the government contracts arena. You have to have an actual reduction of practice. So the fi mere filing of a patent application is one of the big differences when dealing with the government as opposed to dealing solely in the commercial uh, marketplace. I mentioned before that uh, the government generally won't take title to the invention, but it can. Uh, sometimes the contractor develops a subject invention and has no interest in it uh, for going, going in a different direction business-wise, so they're not willing to pursue that, that invention. But generally speaking, what happens is contractors, you know, in 90 probably plus percent of the cases decide they want to elect title. But what happens if it fails to elect title or fails to pursue a patent in a timely manner? or fails to disclose an invention on the proper forms, as an example, through uh, DD-854 uh, with the uh, government, uh, with the Department of Defense. The contractor can lose uh, title to the invention, and the government would, would retain title. But the government still gets a license, uh, and the government still gets a revocable, non-exclusive, paid-up license to utilize that invention. So all is not lost, but the key here is uh, those who control the bundle of sticks or who has actual ownership or title to the invention controls the invention. So it's important as a contractor, if you want to continue licensing that invention, utilizing that invention, it's important to make sure you follow the proper procedures and protocols in, in, uh, in disclosing that invention and following the proper, proper paperwork. And certainly in the commercial context, uh, if the contractor gives up its rights to the invention, there's no default to the contractor retains the license. It's just the commercial contractor gives up the license, um, and that's certainly negotiable among the parties. Uh, but it's a little unique in government contracts, again, where if, if the contractor fails to elect title, it still is able to retain the license. Um, and, and the real uh, philosophy here is that you know, there are steps that you have to comply with as a contractor to make sure that um, you retain title to the invention. And, and kind of the philosophy here is that this is being paid for by the taxpayer and so that it's, you know, a real privilege to be able to kind of retain ownership to the patent. And therefore, the government wants to make sure that you're diligent in, um, you know, making them aware of the invention, disclosing the invention, um, electing title to the invention, filing the invention, reporting the invention. So there's just a number of steps that need to be complied with in order for you to retain title. And there's also a difference between uh, the DFARS and the FARS. Uh, just, um, for example, with regard to disclosure, the first step is to actually 
you need to disclose the invention, uh, the subject invention that you come up with uh, to um, the, the government. And so you have, under the DFARS, you have uh, a two-month period to disclose to contractor personnel who are responsible for the patent matters, or six months after you actually discover uh, the invention, whichever time period is earlier. So you have those two time periods that put a limit on when you can dis dis you need to disclose it to the government. And uh, under FAR uh, 52-227-11, if there's a two-month period in which you have to disclose it to contractor personnel who are responsible for patent matters. And kind of the, the philosophy behind this is, they, um, you know, you've got an obligation. The government wants to know about these inventions right away, you shouldn't be sitting on this. And so if you want to retain title, you need to be um, diligent in disclosing to the government uh, what's going on uh, with this invention. It just kind of is a, it's a memorialization is kind of good faith with between, you know, you as the contractor and the government to make sure you disclose it. Uh, once you've disclosed it, then you have to elect whether you're gonna take ownership or title to the invention. And so under the DFARS, you have an eight-month period uh, to disclose the invention to the contracting officer. And then under the FAR, you have two years of disclosure, two-year two period in which you can um, not disclosure, but two, after two years of disclosure to elect title. And so it's not enough just to disclose the invention. You have an additional time period in which you would um, make the determination that you actually want to keep the invention to yourself and keep ownership to, to the patent. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, the uh, you actually have to have ownership of the um, the patents uh, before you can elect title. And uh, it's a, a famous Supreme Court case. It's called Stanford v. Roach, and and dealt with that issue. Um, this basically involved uh, an HIV testing uh, technology in which the um, the inventor was a professor working for Stanford University, and the um, the inventor signed an agreement, and this is kind of a, it's more of an amorphous signing of um, rights and materials and inventions to Stanford, but it was done um, in, in very general terms. It wasn't specific, and it was just an agreement to, um, you know, convey inventions in the future. Um, there was no reference to anything actually developed, and so it was very kind of an amorphous um, agreement um, that was involved here. Um, this same inventor actually uh, went to work for a private company, uh, Cetus, which eventually was acquired by um, Roach Diagnostics, and signed this very specific agreement where it affirmatively agreed to assign title to the actual inventions and improvements. And so here's, you've got a kind of an affirmative actual assignment of something that's been developed while the prior one was um, an amorphous assignment of potential things that may be developed. And so those are the kind of the two agreements that were involved. And um, what happened is the, uh, the government, the Supreme Court determined that, um, you know, the original basis in patent law is that you know, once you invent it, you are the original owner of that invention. And that's kind of the foundation of patent law. And you can assign that invention, but if you create, you conceive and reduce a patent invention to practice and file a patent that you are the original owner of that invention uh, uh, recited in that patent. And so, therefore, um, um, even though you, under the Bayh-Dole Act, um, which uh, allocates um, and talks about the um, ownership of inventions, that original foundation of the law in which the inventor actually owns the invention will not be superseded. And so here the Supreme Court said um, the only agreement that was specific to actually assigning an invention was that CETUS agreement, which actually assigned an existing invention. And therefore the inventor uh, formally assigned the invention and it did not go to Stanford. And so just because Stanford did work under the agreement, it, did, it still did not um, um, have a formal assignment. Therefore, the rights from the inventor was not conveyed. And so uh, 
you know, basically was saying under this 35 U.S.C. 202, um, you know, the contractors can, you know, elect to retain title to the invention um, under the agreement, and they tried to argue that, um, you know, the language in their agreement kind of encompassed all work that was done, but the Supreme Court said, you know, we're not going to change the original law in which um, whoever invents, whoever is the inventor and first to conceive and reduce invention to practice is the owner and trump that in any way, you would need, the inventor would have to sign a very specific agreement to an actual invention uh, that was conceived and not some kind of future right. And so that's basically how the um, you know, Supreme Court came down. It did not change the law. And so if you're a university, what you need to keep in mind is is to have your researchers sign a very formal, concrete assignment of your invention to make sure that you do not fall in the same situation. Because just because it's annual federally funded research that takes place, unless you have a very concrete, specific assignment of the your researchers' invention, um, it still will title will still be conveyed to them first and. Um, it's, it will not be uh, trumped by the Bayh-Dole Act. And, Kevin, one of the things that the Supreme Court said, uh, and it was sort of very instructive, and as lawyers, you know, where we always say words do matter, in this case it really did. And as a, a government contract case, the Supreme Court sort of, you know, doesn't happen very often. So we all, the government contract attorneys in the community, get very excited when the Supreme Court rules on a, on a, on a government contract case. But it actually boils it down to some, some basic words. If you have an assignment uh, that you want an employee to sign or a consultant to sign, the real key is to have a present assignment. I assign. I do. I hereby do assign. Not I will assign in the future. And that magic language really would have helped Stanford out quite a bit. But unfortunately for Stanford, that language was not in their agreements. Right. The way it was structured was uh, it was a wish that something that may or may not be developed to be assigned, and so it is very tentative, um, definitely. Um, the other obligations you have um, involve just uh, general patent law obligations that you um, you have, and so you have um, um, you have to meet uh, statutory deadlines, and also uh, under the um, DFAR and the FAR, you have a one-year uh, time period to file your uh, patent application once you've claimed title. But these statutory deadlines are basically um, if you've commercially used the invention, if you've commercially disclosed the invention on a non-confidential basis, um, it starts a one-year time period in the U.S., and your patent can be in invalid after that point. A um, number of con foreign countries have what's called absolute novelty, and you could, uh, if you disclose or commercial use your invention, you could lose your rights immediately. And so you have to comply with those statutory deadlines. Um, and and so that that's kind of a crucial thing where you could end up losing losing your rights. Um, other report, reporting obligations: if you're going to uh, file your patent application abroad uh, in foreign countries, you have to notify the U.S. government. If you're abandoning the patent or the patent application, you need to notify the government. And here it's just a matter of, uh, you know, kind of fair play. The government's giving you a right um, based on uh, to own the patent, even though uh, you've, it's based on taxpayer-sponsored money in the government contract. And therefore, it's it's felt the um, that you have an obligation to at least give the government the right to, um, ha you know, be able to obtain the patent again if you don't want that. And so it's a way of kind of putting the burden on the contractor to say, you know, if you, if you don't want these patent rights, just you need to make the government aware of it before it goes abandoned and it becomes in the public domain so they can take action. And so it's just kind of a matter of, of fair play. And the same thing goes with paying maintenance fees or in foreign countries annuities. You have to let the government know that so they can step in and the government may, may not, but it, it's just a matter of fair play that uh, things aren't put in the public domain that they can actually uh, take action on that. Um, there's also a reporting requirement for you know, inventions made during the year, how they've been utilized, what steps have been taken, have, have they been commercialized. And once again, it's just kind of a matter of communicating with the government and keeping them up to, up to speed as to exactly what progress is being made with the patent um, and just the communication process. Uh, there are also USPTO or the United States Patent Office 
trademark office requirements. And that is, uh, you, you know, part of the patent process is you draft a patent application. They will uh, what's called examine the patent application and typically give you an office action. You have a time limit in order to respond to that office action. And uh, and so you have to be do that in a timely manner. They could uh, the patent office could claim there's more than one invention, um, and so there's when they send you an office action there are uh, you know time limits. Uh, you can get extensions, but it's, it's still there's a, a maximum amount of extensions you can obtain, and if you don't comply with that, your patent will go abandoned. So you need to comply with the U.S. Patent Office requirements um, in that area. Well, Kevin and I have just talked about the basic underpinnings of uh, uh, title and filing obligations dealing with patents. There are a few unique issues that I think are worthwhile to talk about before we turn our attention to technical data and computer software. The first is one that we, we often get calls on, and, and, and frequently those calls are in a frantic mode, and it goes something like this. Uh, phone rings, we answer it, and a client or potential client is on the other end of the phone and says, I'm worried that the government's going to take my patent rights once I have title to the invention. And what they're referring to generally is something called marching rights. And if the Bayh-Dole Act applies, the government theoretically has the right to license your uh, patent to others uh, if the contractor fails to commercialize the invention. Uh, I can tell you categorically the government has never exercised marching rights to date. Uh, and nor will they exercise those marching rights. If they did, it would have a tremendous chilling effect on any company wanting to do business with the U.S. government. So although there have been a few cases filed, as I said, the government has never exercised patent rights. I, I don't believe they ever will. Uh, it really is much ado about nothing. But just theoretically speaking, uh, under the statute, under 35 U.S.C. Section 203, the government has the right to march in and take title to your invention if you don't commercialize it and... Uh, you know, for base of health, safety, and welfare purposes, whether it's a public use uh, purpose that uh, requires uh, commercialization and use of the patent, the government can march in and take rights to your patent. But as I said, the government has not exercised those rights in the past. And on the commercial front, if you fail to commercialize, basically there's there's not the same issue. I mean, there are numerous patents that people do not commercialize, and so if you're just doing it as a private entity and you're not subject to a government contract, um, it's not unheard of that you don't commercial commercialize the invention. Um, typically, you you spend some money obtaining the patent, so it's in your best interest to commercialize it uh, typically, or or figure out a way to license the technology or do something else with the technology to to make some money from it, but there, there's not the same burden put on you to actually get, take it to market. And in some cases, you may have a, a patent that might be um, considered great technology. It's just um, a potentially the price point is too high uh, for you to make money from it, or there might be other uh, issues, um, manufacturing issues, et cetera. The second issue that we want to talk about is domestic preferences. And it's, it's under the statute, it's 35 U.S.C. Section 204. It's the U.S. manufacturing requirement or the, or the preference for American industry. Um, and you see, you see those U.S. manufacturing requirement or the preference for U.S. industry um, uh, provisions. And wh what those do is it requires that <clears throat> prior to any subject invention being licensed by a contractor to a third party, uh, and if that license has to be an exclusive license, the contractor must require that the exclusive licensee manufacture the subject invention substantially in the United States. So the first, the first level of review is, are we talking about an exclusive license? And oftentimes, if we get a call about this, it's not an exclusive license, so this provision doesn't come into play. But if you are a, if you are a holder of, uh, of a subject invention and you want to license that exclusively to a third party, you can. But that invention has to be manufactured substantially in the United States. Uh, now, that provision can be waived if, for example, there's no domestic sources to manufacture your invention or there's a public interest exception available. Uh, but generally speaking, if you, if you say, well, it costs a lot more to manufacture it here in the United States than it does in Europe or Asia, uh, China in particular, um, 
you know, therefore we want to be able to have an exclusive license with, with a Chinese third party. The government doesn't look fondly upon that. Uh, in fact, the government generally uses those cost differentials as not a basis for granting uh, waivers. Uh, so that's just another provision to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, but as I said, that's only in the context of an exclusive license. And on the commercial front, um, it's typically not the same scenario. I mean, uh, in some cases, you might receive money to, in, to manufacture in the U.S., and you have to comply with those commitments to, to keep whatever tax credits you receive. Or if you've made uh, public statements, you, you don't want to put out false advertising, and uh, the Federal Trade Commission could get involved. Um, so there's other there's repercussions for not manufacturing, but typically involves you to make some kind of commitment that you are manufacturing here in the U.S. and um, um, you know there's a made in the U.S.A. service mark, and if you don't do that, and then you could end up um, being decertified using your certification mark um, and things like that. So there are repercussions that are available, but it's not the same scenario as under a, a government contract. We also want to talk about something we call the battle of infringement. Uh, let's just say a contractor has a subject invention and did everything it was supposed to do. There are still situations when working with the U.S. government that um, uh, the U.S. government can um, and has in the past, or a contractor can and has in the past, use that, sub that patent on that subject invention without permission. That use, or in the commercial context, would most likely be deemed an infringement it's not deemed an infringement when working with the government. The sole remedy for that quote-unquote non-infringement is a reasonable royalty. There's no injunction, there's no treble damages, there's no attorney fees, and that has to be litigated in the Court of Federal Claims, which is here in Washington. Essentially, uh, that, um, uh, that infringement, or non-infringement if you will, uh, occurs because of something called the authorization and consent clause that is in most government contracts. You will see that clause at 52.227-1, and if that clause is in your contract, it does provide an affirmative defense to any allegation of infringement. Uh, a couple procedural things. It must be raised by the defendant, um, and so if you were accused of infringement, you say, I have authorization and consent under my government contract, well, the government could argue that, um, that you are not infringing a particular subject invention. What types of infringement are we talking about? We're talking about two basic types of infringement. There's direct infringement, which is the use of um, uh, uh, manufacture by the United States government. So the um, uh, sorry, use or manufacture by the US, by the United States government. So the U.S. government essentially is infringing on the patent, um, and it was unaware probably when it entered into the contract that it would be infringing on the patent. There's indirect infringement, which is use or manufacture for the U.S. government. So a contractor is infringing on, on, on the patent. Uh, I, I should say, however, where the contract is you succeed the authorization and consent clause, those either direct or indirect infringement examples that I just gave, the private contractor may be enjoined through an injunction uh, by the company bringing the infringement suit. The authorization and consent clause only provides coverage to the infringement that's um, uh, uh, enabled under the clause in and of itself. Uh, so, and essentially, to, to wrap this up, U.S. government authorizes patent use by contractors and consents to be sued for patent use if, in fact, you are infringing on one of those subject inventions. But the only remedy is a reasonable royalty uh, and not a proper injunction like you would in the, in the, in the commercial context. Yeah, and then the commercial contrast is quite a bit different because you can actually, if someone else is making, using, or selling your invention, you have the right to... Uh, Pursue that, and so it's it's not the same scenario. It's tampered. It's uh, um, you have to figure out what damages you potentially would have to make it. See if it's as a practical matter, but theoretically you can go after uh, any other party that makes, uses, or sells your patent invention. We 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 are for now switching uh, discussions here. Um, uh, Going to talk about technical data and computer software. Uh, we've just spent a good bit of time talking about patents and inventions, where we deal with, if one of the things you can remember today, when you deal with patents, you're dealing with title, who owns the invention. Uh, here we're dealing with licensing. Um, 
uh, technical data computer software, the contractor retains title to the data or software, or, or both. Uh, but in terms of the rights the government gets, we're talking about a license. And to really understand this, I often ask three questions. And the first question is, are we dealing with technical data, computer software, or both? Uh, the second question is, are we dealing with data or software that's being acquired by um, DOD under the DFARS or a civilian agency under the FAR? And the third question uh, is, and equally as important, is are we dealing with a commercial item procurement or a non-commercial item procurement? If you give me the answers to those three questions, I pretty much can tell you within a matter of minutes what the rights are to that particular data and or software. And as we said, we're dealing with rights and license rights here and we're not dealing with title issues. And generally speaking, the rights and license issues under for data and software are determined by who funded that data or software which is delivered in the performance of the government contract. Well, let's talk briefly on what technical data is. Uh, technical data is any recorded information of a scientific or technical nature in any form. Uh, and as an example, it includes drawings, research methods, findings, designs, processes. For those involved in large-scale programs, you may find technical data in presentation packages for PDRs or CDRs. Uh, uh, and so software development plans, even though we're talking about technical data, Software development plans in and of themselves are generally construed under the regulations as technical data. It's not know-how, it's not hardware. Uh, those, those things are not covered under the data rights clauses. And for your information, the data rights clauses uh, under the FAR for civilian agency procurements, we're talking 52.227-14. And for the DFARS, we're talking 252.227-14. 713 for technical data and 714 for computer software. As you can see, the Department of Defense under the DFARS uh, segregates data and software into two separate clauses, where in the FAR we have a situation where it's all wrapped up under the rights and data clause at 52.2. And so uh, compute, computer software is um, actually includes computer programs. Um, Includes uh, computer programs, source code, object code, uh, design details, algorithms, flowcharts. It's, it's all items that are, um, it's either the program or things closely tied into the actual software program code. And so those are the, um, you know, that's how the, the definition is kind of laid out, and it's, it's somewhat different. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I, I would say, I would say, one, one interesting facet, and you may want to write these down, and, and once again, if any of these citations you, you miss or you want us to follow up with you, by all means, let us know. Uh, but interestingly, uh, computer software does not include uh, computer databases. Computer databases under the FAR and under the uh, DFARS are both treated as technical data. Uh, and I think that's just an interesting tidbit, an interesting interpretation of the regulations that computer databases are treated as technical data. Um, the next item is basically rights and technical data and computer software. One of the most crucial issues where clients come to us with, with problems is, you know, the rights they have, and that um, ties in directly to how it's funded. And so basically you have uh, one source is um, where the government has unlimited rights um, to the technical data and computer software, and that's where the government funds it um, 100%. Um, there's limited or restricted rights where you fund, as a contractor, fund uh, the technical data or the computer, so the development of the um, technical data, computer software. And then there's a, one called government purpose, which is mixed funding. Uh, it's Department of Defense only, and that's kind of um, a mix of the two. And then you also have uh, the opportunity to have specially negotiated license rights. Um, Basically, in all these, uh, the contractor remains the owner of the data and the software and can use these uh, assets freely and unless specifically restricted. Um, the government obtains the license and not the title. Uh, think of it this way. The government, like if they have unlimited rights, they can do whatever they want with it, and it's only the negative aspects of ownership that they actually um, 
they, the contractor obtains. So that they have uh, full rights to do whatever they want. And, and um, these are basically the standard license rights that you would obtain. The thing to, to kind of keep in mind and be careful of here, which creates huge problems for clients, is um, being able to kind of document where you got the funds, how they came um, into being for when you develop the technical data or the computer software. You also want to think strategically. Let's say you're developing software. Um, you don't want to... Um, let's say you've developed a pre-existing software that's your corporate jewels that you've independently developed, and then there's a module that the government um, financed under a contract. You want to be able to kind of keep those two separately because you want to keep – because the rights are going to be very different as to what the government can do uh, with the software. And if you keep it separate, then the government would only be, have these unlimited rights uh, to that little additional module. And so you always want to kind of um, – when you develop the software or develop the technical data, uh, make sure you segregate it if, if need be and be, able to sh and be able to show how you came up with it. So if you have to go to the government and say, this is something we developed, you, you need to be able to prove that. And so those are two um, major things to keep in mind that would uh, prevent uh, a tremendous amount of problems that most clients have in the government contract arena. Um, unlimited rights, uh, as I alluded before, it's where the U.S. government can use or disclose the data for any purpose whatsoever, um, data and the software. They can even publish it, uh, and they can grant the third parties the same broad rights in data and software. And so it's a very wide open, broad uh, opportunity. And so, like I said before, you don't want things um, going into that um, category that you where you've actually spent, um, you know, the, your money as a contractor in developing. You want to keep as much as you can out of that category because they have a literally carte blanche to do whatever they want um, with the software and the data. And so you, um, you want to kind of, you don't want to wrong, you don't want to inadvertently give them those unlimited rights unless you absolutely have to, unless it's appropriate. Um, Government purpose rights, uh, as Kevin mentioned at the outset, is really a, a, a unique animal to the under the DFARS. It does not exist in civilian procurements. Uh, so if, in fact, you have a situation where you have a jointly funded developmental program, uh, the Department of Interior, or through uh, any other civilian agency, uh, and the government put in one penny uh, and you put in $10 million. Uh, the fall provision is unlimited rights. There's no government purpose rights in the, in the civilian acquisition context. Uh, I will say the Department of Energy has a similar type GPR provision under special license rights, but you know, generally speaking, the default provision in the, under the FAR is if there's a joint funding situation, rights go to, uh, rights uh, default to unlimited rights. But government purpose rights, what is it? And, and as it says on the slide, the government can use the data and software within the government for quote unquote government purposes without restriction. Now what does that really mean? That primarily means for purposes of reprocurement. So as an example, you have technology on one program. That technology, whether it's data or software, may be given to another contractor as long as it's on another program uh, for purposes of reprocurement or for other government purposes. Uh, contractors cannot uh, charge the U.S. government for rights to use GPR, either technical data or computer software, but that data or software is protectable in the commercial market. So the government can't give it to uh, a third party, and that third party goes out and commercializes the technology uh, and, and sells it commercially. Uh, that third party and the government are unable to do that in accordance with the, the government purpose license rights. So, therefore, it could have a very broad effect. Uh, if, in fact, there's no commercial application uh, for your government purpose rights technology, you have to ask yourself, what does this really get you? Uh, because if this could be given to a competitor, you could be at a competitive disadvantage. Also, as we all know, any engineer worth his or her salt can take a, a spec or some source code uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, reverse engineer uh, your proprietary technology. Uh, we hope that's not the case and 
that procedures and policies put in place under the FAR and DFARS to NDA and NDA-like agreement. But at the end of the day, you know, there is a risk that a competitor could get your technology through government purpose rights, and you just have to be aware and cognizant of that as you work through as you work through the process. With limited rights, uh, limited rights is, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with government contracts, limited rights is limited to technical data. Uh, we'll talk about restricted rights in a moment. That's computer software. But here's where the terms, once again, really do matter. Uh, computer software uh, and limited rights, uh, never the two shall meet. Limited rights is with technical data, and restricted rights is with computer software. Uh, limited rights uh, may be used or reproduced within the U.S. government. Uh, limited rights tech data may not be disclosed outside the U.S. government, and it may not be used for manufacturing. Interestingly, the DFARS, we have a little bit of a um, divergence of um, use, uh, license rights here, and the DFARS does permit the use um, uh, of the limited rights data for emergency repair or overhaul. Uh, can be given to foreign governments for foreign acquisitions. And I highlighted this next case because we're seeing more and more of this in the, in the government contracting marketplace. And that is support contractors uh, can get access to a contractor's limited rights data. Uh, and, and that happens where these support contractors are supporting the agency as either advisory uh, and assistance contractors, M&O type contractors. And so at the end of the day, uh, those contractors, those uh, A&A contractors or M&O contractors are required, as I mentioned before, to sign an NDA or NDA type agreement uh, through the FAR or the DFARS, uh, but they do have access to your data. Uh, and that's something you want to be very careful of because in, in many cases a lot of these support contractors also are your competitors on the actual procurement itself. And that's where we get into organizational conflicts of interest, which certainly is not the subject of today's presentation. But it's something that you need to consider, especially in the shrinking acquisition community. I will also say the FAR, although it doesn't have these sort of three or four examples as uh, included on your slide in front of you, it does permit outside uses as listed in the contract. And this may be another red line moment for the, for the webinar, and that is, you know, whether it's IP, whether it's, you know, delivery obligations, whether it's payment obligations, billing obligations, please read and carefully scrub your contract before you sign it. Uh, most of the problems we, we, we receive here are we ask a question about what a certain provision on the contract is, and oftentimes, unfortunately, the answer we get back is, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I've never looked at the contract. So please read and carefully scrub your contract as you, as you go through the process. And the key is you just – you do not want things that are uh, – you know, technical data that is deemed to have limited rights ac accidentally falling into the unlimited rights category uh, just because of the fact that you have not uh, separated and you can't prove where it was financed. You want to uh, strategically make sure throughout the process you make sure it falls within limited rights because it, 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 it's much more restrictive as to what the government can do with your technology. Um, you can also do uh, specifically negotiate license rights, and they're negotiated rights negotiated by the parties. And the, the, the fallback is, though, you can't be less than what's limited or restricted, um, but you can tailor it, uh, tailor it narrower than the general uh, uh, government purpose rights. And so uh, the key is um, there are certain ways you can kind of protect your technology. There may be certain nuances. Uh, how your uh, technology is delineated, and you can put that in an actual agreement. And, and as long as it, it doesn't provide, is more uh, n narrow and more restrictive than what's providing limited or restricted rights, you can provide more protection um, uh, for you. And so there's some real advantage there, uh, <clears throat> having a uh, specifically negotiated license. Another, another aspect that's kind of analogous to the uh, limited rights on technical data is restricted rights for software. And basically this is a separate category, um, and the U.S. government has to use the software on one computer or terminal at a time. It's not time-shared. You can, however, transfer uh, to another agency computer. You can make copies for archive, um, archiving, backup, or modification. You can modify the software. Uh, you can, it allows you to make a disclosure to service, the government to make a disclosure to service contractors to correct deficiencies or modify for urgent uh, tactical situations. Um, 
you can disclose the contractors for emergency repair or overhaul. And in, in few lim unlimited cases, you have unlimited, the government gets unlimited rights in certain types of funded, um, types of software or funded software. And so the thing to keep in mind here is it's kind of analogous. It's much more restrictive as to what the government can do with the software. And so you just need to make sure that um, when you create your software, if you're creating modules and some of it, the modules are under a government contract and your original is your corporate jewels, you make sure you keep the corporate jewels separate, you you handle the financing separate, you keep the documentation separate, and the same way with a government contract. And so the um, and that way you maximize um, what's under the restricted rights, and you keep uh, you limit what the government has unlimited rights in. And so it, it's just a, a separate category, so to speak, and you just need to be kind of aware of that. And, and the real heartache that most clients have is just to kind of a, not do this after the fact, is to be proactive throughout the process when you develop this, is to make sure that you... Uh, carefully, strategically set your software aside and improvements aside and, and delineate, and you don't create a software kind of stew, so to speak, where everything is mixed together and you can't delineate what was done before or afterward, because uh, if you can't, then that ends up unlimited rights, and that is, uh, and if that involves your uh, corporate crown jewels, that could be a huge problem for you. Kevin and I have spoken about the license rights for data and software. Those license rights are for non-commercial items, uh, and those rights and licensing obligations are set forth in the FAR and DFAR, DFARs, respectively. One of the things contractors should consider is leveraging the FAR definition of a commercial item at FAR 2.101, uh, because FAR, the definition of a commercial item and those commercial item provisions are set forth under FAR Part 12, provides contractors with the opportunity to negotiate special license rights, certainly on the IP front as well. Uh, but before we begin, I think we should take a step back and look at what is a commercial item. And for that, as I said, you would go to FAR 2.101 and see what a very broad definition commercial item is. It's certainly broader than COTS or commercial off-the-shelf item. There's no sales requirement for a commercial item, and that, and that means you don't even have to have a sale. Uh, of, of the item. As long as it's been offered for sale, license, or lease in the commercial marketplace, you have a commercial item. Uh, it also includes, you know, uh, the evolution of the technology. So products that have evolved through advances in time and technology or performance also will qualify as a commercial item. It also may include product modifications. You could have a minor modification to meet a federal, specific federal government requirement, and you could still qualify as a commercial item. And as a commercial item, there are a number of advantages, uh, including removing a number of the uh, FAR and DFARS clauses that we see pages and pages of flow down to, to contractors, either at the prime contract level or the subcontract level. Uh, and certainly this course is about intellectual property, so we're talking about those clauses at 52.227 or 252.227-X, Y, and Z. Uh, those clauses can be removed, uh, or at least if the clauses are in there, the right commercial item clauses are in there, which allow contractors to use their standard commercial licenses instead of the rigid non-commercial item license rights categories that Kevin and I have been discussing. One of the things we thought we'd do for you is to provide you with some basis uh, and some justification when talking with contracting officers to use the commercial item provisions. Uh, we have found a lot of times that commercial uh, that contracting officers may or may or may not be aware of FAR Part par 12, or really have not used it very often. So these following citations and references are often very helpful in, in having a contracting officer understand that the rights and obligations to the parties enable uh, uh, contractors to use their customary commercial licenses. We'll start with computer software, uh, and I'll break this down for you real briefly. Computer software under the DFARS. If you were to look at the regulation itself, not even the clause, but the regulation itself, at DFARS 227.7202, and under the FAR at Part 12, 12.212, um, and maybe even to a lesser extent, FAR 27.405-3, uh, that gets that sort of goes to the contractor's rights to use their customary commercial licenses to deliver software to the federal government. 
Uh, you may ask you may ask about FAR 52.227-19, and I've seen a, a question on the board. But let me just address that now. Uh, that that clause, which is restricted rights for commercial items, is you know, for lack of a better way to say it, just a ridiculous clause. Uh, it's not well thought out. Uh, it's uh, fairly nonsensical. In that all it does is provide restricted rights uh, to the contractor. Uh, and that's certainly not a clause that uh, uh, should be relied upon uh, as, as we negotiate our contracts with the federal government. For technical data, uh, I would point you to FAR 12.211 um, and also DFARS 252-227-7015. And once again, that goes to, in many cases, the ability of contractors to use uh, their customary commercial licenses. There's been a few recent changes in the DFARS in the treatment of commercial items. Um, and I would just point your uh, attention to that previous clause I mentioned, DFARS 252-227-7015, which essentially states that commercial items uh, and the use of commercial items is mandatory wherever possible, and DFARS 252-227-7013, uh, which is the technical data clause under the DFARS, uh, as well as dash 7015, and the requirement is that both those clauses must be included uh, if any of the development of a government contract is um, at, at government expense. Uh, so you really have to sort of juxtapose those two clauses together as you negotiate your contract with the federal government. And, and the philosophy here with the federal government is, is reasonable. What they're trying to say is if you've got certain terms and conditions, you license your software, let's say on, um, and you do that to all your other customers, there's a built-in assumption that these are, are relatively reasonable, and therefore, unless there's something that uh, strikes the contracting officer as being something they can't, that um, is in violation of federal re regulations, uh, they should be willing to kind of accept that, and it, it's meant to uh, expedite the process, so to speak. So uh, there's a good motivation behind that. And finally, Talk about a few key licensing considerations. Uh, Kevin and I, you know, uh, will deliver this course, and we'll sometimes spend, you know, you know, two hours on, on this very slide alone. Uh, we certainly won't do that to you today. But let me just say a few things about some licensing considerations uh, from a government contract context. And I know Kevin has uh, some things to say as well. Uh, but but first is, you know, in terms of your commercial item agreement that you're providing to the government, uh, if in fact you have a commercial item uh, and you're not operating under the standard terms and conditions of, you know, uh, the rights and data clause or the, or the technical data or computer software clauses for non-commercial items under the FAR and DFARS, again, respectively, you know, please understand what the government can agree to negotiate and what they cannot agree to negotiate. Uh, the government certainly is obligated to utilize the contractor's, you know, standard commercial terms and conditions, uh, customary commercial license agreement as a, as a prime example. Uh, but there are certain things the government just can't agree to. Uh, one in particular that sort of stands out is the indemnification clause. Uh, in most cases, um, the governments will look to strike the indemnification clause that's in most contractors' commercial item licensing arrangement agreements because the government under the, or in accordance with the Anti-Deficiency Act, can't obligate funds that have not been appropriated. It's a violation of federal law. So they ask to remove that clause from the license agreement. Generally, that's okay, uh, and we don't have a problem doing that. If, on the other hand, there's been an uh, uh, appropriation and there's funding available under the contract for indemnification, uh, then you're not violating the Anti-Deficiency Act. And yes, you can have a indemnification clause or a limited indemnification clause within, within your license agreement. So that has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally speaking, most of the time, the indemnification clauses come out of the contract. We see similar types of um, uh, discussions around the uh, inspection and acceptance clauses and the and, and the warranty and the warranty clause. Uh, those are those are useful in terms of the government has certain in inspection or acceptance uh, requirements or certain warranty uh, requirements, and they can't obligate themselves to, to uh, 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 steer uh, steer clear of those. So often those have to be either modified or arranged under the under the government uh, under the licensing. Agreement. Uh, so when you when you begin those negotiations with the government, please keep that in mind that you know the government certainly has to understand your perspective, and that is you can use your customary commercial license, but you should at least be cognizant of the government's you know uh, uh, responsibilities in terms of not being able to 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 agree to every term and condition in your licensing arrangement. 
And uh, one major issue is that there are marking obligations. And so these categories that we provide to you uh, before, um, you actually are obligated to use marking language and put that on either the technical data or the software. And it's, it's very specific language in the regulations uh, when you deliver it to the government agency. And so it's, it's very specific, and you need to do that. Otherwise, you could actually end up losing your rights, and they can become, let's say, unlimited rights when you, uh, they should have been, um, let's say, restricted or, or limited rights. And so you can end up with huge problems. And so if I had to say with 90% of our government contract uh, clients that the big issues is being able to kind of uh, monetarily prove um, items, either technical data or software that you've developed and be able to prove that, uh, be able to keep that separate and then mark that. And so when you're providing that to the government, uh, you're using the correct marking language. And if you, if you do that, um, you know, uh, the vast majority of numerous problems that clients come to us with, would you'd be able to overcome that. And so those are kind of the issues you really need to keep in mind. Um, you know, delineating it, um, strategically thinking about it and keeping things separate, and then uh, making sure you mark it when you deliver it to the, to the government. And so that's, um, that's a major area to look at, make sure you're doing things correctly to make sure that you've curtail the government as much as, as possible, that you're obtaining, uh, they can only, they're limited um, based on what you've invested and you're, they're protecting your corporate jewels to the maximum extent possible. Um, other aspects to kind of look at, um, just to, as commercial red flags, is just different provisions in the various agreements, um, you know, that, that kind of create issues as far as what can be done and what can't be done. A lot of times you want to look at uh, kind of the rights and, and things like that that the government can do uh, with the software, um, look at all the various provisions in there, um, and kind of constrict that to as much as, as you possibly can. Um, there are numerous situations where um, you have the uh, separate software license and just kind of make sure that you think strategically through to make sure the government um, is restricted in protecting your software or uh, technical data as much as possible. Um, also kind of keep in mind uh, kind of the patent aspect of it and, and make sure you uh, protect it um, and uh, you follow through on all the uh, various protections and, and obligations you have to the government um, and also to the to patent office. And so... Uh, I'm sorry, Kerry, that, that, that sort of, you know, brings us to the end of our formal remarks here. Uh, we have uh, two questions uh, have come in, um, and I thought I would just uh, read those to the group and then uh, answer them. And once again, if you have any other questions, feel free to populate the, the, the webinar page. I know we're getting close to the end of time here. And that is uh, in respect to perfect timing, Kevin, and that is with respect to markings, where do you find the language uh, and the restrictive legends to put on either your data or software? Uh, and the answer is um, those markings and restrictive legends can be found in the FAR and DFARS uh, citations I mentioned earlier. But just once again, for uh, civilian agency acquisitions under the FAR, it's FAR 52.227-14, the Rights and Data Clause. And under the DFARS for uh, military or de Department of Defense procurements, we're at uh, uh, DFARS 252.227-7013. Uh, for technical data and dash 7014 for computer software. Now, just keep in mind that those legends are um, uh, are written uh, into the uh, regulatory language. Uh, th this is not a time for creative writing. You may not like the verbiage. You may not like how long they are. Uh, but as I said, these are the legends that you need to use. You should really put them on, uh, you know, every potential surface or embed them in the software as much as possible um, because, once again, without those markings and if you deviate from those markings, uh, you can have yourself a uh, world of pain and the, the courts and the boards uh, who uh, you know, adjudicate these issues on behalf of contractors have not been kind to the contracting community who have failed to mark their technology properly. Uh, the second question is, can a piece of software uh, have multiple uh, license rights? And the answer is yes, uh, they can. 
uh, in terms of in terms of um, uh, the, the actual software, if uh, the, the module of software was developed, but there is you know multiple submodules, each one of those submodules can have a different rights allocation, once again, depending on who funded the development of that submodule. So as an example, if you were looking at a piece of software that had four submodules and two of the pieces were developed exclusively at private expense, those two submodules would be allocated with restricted rights to the federal government. If there was a piece of software, and this is a military procurement, that was you know jointly funded 50-50, each party put in a million dollars, and that third module would, would be sub-module would, would be government purpose rights. Um, and then last but not least, if the government came back six months later and said, we'd like you know, another module of the software added here, and the, and, the, and the contractor had no interest in pursuing this, but the government said, we'll pay you a million dollars to, to develop this, you take the million dollars and you provide that fourth module or sub-module with unlimited rights data. So on that one piece of software, you could have three different rights allocations. You could have restricted rights, government purpose rights, and unlimited rights. And if you have any further questions on that, by all means, let us know. And, and it's, it's very uh, common, too, also, just to have a module. Let's say part of it is just you've got your own corporate jewel software just to have a module that provides an interface to the government system. And so that is very common. And so that module to the government system is something with – uh, you know, unlimited rights, typically the government can disseminate that, but when it comes to your individual software, um, you know, the optimal thing would be to have a separate license agreement, maybe, hopefully maybe even your commercial license, that really restricts the government so they can't disseminate that uh, to the free world. And so it's kind of crucial to have that. And what you don't want to have is to take your module add-in and blend it in and into one big uh, software stew, so to speak, so the whole thing becomes um, unlimited rights. That's that's your worst case nightmare scenario that you want to avoid. We you have want another to make sure question. You keep it separate. We, we, yes, keeping it keeping it simple and clean and understanding who funded what is, is critical. We have we have another question. Uh, does the marking of the rights on data include the ITAR statement? This is a two part question. So uh, let me let me take that first. Uh, generally speaking, the uh, marking of the rights on data does not include the ITAR statement under the FAR and DFARS. That's a separate area of the law under the export controls provisions, and the ITAR has its own markings, uh, but the, the rights and data clause and the uh, commercial terms and conditions, uh, I'm sorry, and the uh, non-commercial terms and conditions for data and software under the DFARS does not include an ITAR statement. Uh, but I think as, as at least maybe inferred in the question, if there's ITAR controlled uh, technology, that needs to be addressed in not only markings, but in, in the proper agreements and licenses with the, with the federal government. Um, uh, the next question is, um, what are the tech data and computer software? Three questions. I couldn't discern those from the slides. That I apologize for. Let me give you those questions again. Uh, the first question is, are we dealing with technical data, computer software, or both? Second question is, are we dealing with a civilian agency acquisition under the FAR or a DOD acquisition under the DFARS? And last and certainly not least is, are we dealing with a commercial item where we could utilize a definition under FAR Part 2101 slash FAR Part 12? or are we dealing with a non-commercial item acquisition? Those three questions, the answers to those three questions often get you on your way in terms of analyzing your data and software. Well, that concludes our comments in the question and answer uh, session today. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been terrific talking with you all. I know Kevin has a few closing remarks as well. Um, and some housekeeping items, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, at our um, uh, future uh, webinar series. Yeah, it's been really an honor and a privilege, and, and thank you so much for, uh, uh, for uh, being in a part of this uh, webinar. Um, just want to let you know we've got an exciting uh, last webinar in our government contract series. This is uh, Contract Interpretation with uh, Tim Noker. 
Um, that's on April 8th. Um, also wanted to make you aware that our first webinar, Working with the FAR, is now available, and that's at www.thompsoncoburn.com forward slash the FAR. And so that way uh, you can kind of you can see the entire uh, presentation um, on that. So, uh, And also, if uh, any of you are either live in the St. Louis area or are going to be visiting St. Louis on May 21st, wanted to invite you to our annual uh, government contracts update at the Sheridan Clayton. Um, and so that's kind of an exciting area. You can kind of meet everyone involved in government contracts. Um, I believe we have a happy hour afterwards, so it's a, it's a nice time. You can get the latest law in government contracts and also get a chance to kind of meet um, everyone working in the area of Thompson Coburn. So, um, and, and, I, and I would mention real briefly, I will be there uh, as well. And uh, if you're not from the St. Louis area and would like to attend, I can provide uh, further briefing on the topics, but also we have special travel arrangements that uh, we can help you with And if you're interested in attending that uh, workshop. Okay, and um, once again, I, we really thank you for uh, uh, being a part of this webinar, and uh, thank you for uh, signing in. Um, this is our, my contact information, Jeff's contact information. I know we um, had a lot of information here, and so we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, this is our email and, and phone numbers, and so uh, just feel free to contact us. Um, thank you so much on behalf of Thompson Coburn and for Jeff and myself uh, for being a part of this. It's deeply appreciated.